good morning uh, good afternoon and good evening to all of you in uh, whichever part of the world you are today uh, we will be diving into the world of service mesh and how it help in uh, enhancing and meeting the security and compliance need but uh, before we do that a quick round of introduction my name is ninad desai i am working at infra cloud as a staff engineer uh, in devops and sri space at infra cloud i mainly work to help our clients to handle their need around uh, devops sre and platform engineering mainly around uh, infrastructure design modernization using cloud native technologies like kubernetes and all, all the tech stack that revolves around kubernetes as part of my regular consulting work i happen to work on a implementation of service mesh for few customers to aid their security and compliance need and uh, that's how i thought what you i have uh, learned can share with you all okay so uh, agenda wise we will discuss a range of topics that are central to the service mesh we will explore how microservices emerge as a transformative architectural pattern and the factors that uh, fueled their rise then we will dwell into the critical aspect of uh, security challenges in uh, microservice architecture uh we will discuss complexities that come with a decentralized system and how to address them then we'll turn our attention to the evolution of service mesh i will take you through the historical context of why and how the service mesh came into the existence and their role in overall modern microservice ecosystem then we'll explore the role of service mesh in enhancing security and then moving on we'll discuss how service mesh aids in compliance effort as well and uh, then we'll highlight with some of the examples as well how it meets your uh, regulatory requirements uh, and that eventually making compliance more manageable and uh, later we'll explain how service mesh platform improves in observability as well as making it easy to identify troubleshoot issues zero trust networking is a hot topic and i will discuss how service mesh aligns with the principles of zero trust and finally we will explore service mesh deployment consideration and best practices i will share insights on how to make the most of service mesh while uh, adopt, uh, avoiding the common pitfalls and uh, then we will see the small demo of service mesh capabilities in terms of how they help with uh, authentication and authorization okay so uh, rise of microservice so before the microservice architecture pattern actually gained the popularity the predominant uh, software architecture pattern was a monolithic architecture and it was it was characterized by its single code base where your entire application was built like a single cohesive unit which means all the components module functionalities uh, were bundled together and tightly coupled as a single code base obviously with uh, time spent iterating on the same thing uh, you normally learn a better and efficient way of solving problem and so over past few years uh, to bypass the challenges posed by monolithic microservice pattern came into emergence and it has gained prominence in recent years due to several compelling reasons uh, some of them highlighted here like first is of course scalability uh, so it allows individual services to be scaled uh independent of uh, other services uh for example uh, let's say you have an e-commerce application uh, which has a different microservices like product catalog which handles uh, product information or uh, pricing etc uh, you let's say have another user authentication service which uh, normally is responsible for user login registration and order management service uh, kind of service as well which can help with the process of creating and tracking customer orders so now let's consider a scenario where uh, and your e-commerce platform experience increase in a traffic due to holiday sale event during such event different part of your application may experience different level of workload for example product catalog service uh, due to high user demand product this service can uh, experience a significant a uh, surge in the request uh, from users uh, browser and thus it can cause a load on this service 
but thanks to the microservice nature, you can scale this service horizontally by adding more instances or containers. Uh, for user authentication service, uh, while it is important from user authentication perspective, but uh, on a sales event, you may not experience that much of uh, surge in traffic. So you can uh, scale it uh, to a minimal uh, level without uh, over providing any resources. And for order management service, because people will put lots of order, this service also might experience a surge in traffic. And so you can scale this as well horizontally as and when uh, needed. Uh, so I hope this example uh, demonstrate how each microservice can be scaled independently based on uh, its specific loads uh, or requirement. And uh, this scalability allows you to optimize your resources quite well and maintain an efficient performance during the traffic variation and uh, making sure that your application remains responsive at the same time cost effective as well. And uh, this flexibility uh, also extend to the technology choices as well. Now your team can select most suitable programming languages and framework for each of the service. For example, for user authentication service, maybe Node.js or Ruby can, can be used for quick development and ease of handling user related operations. Uh, for product catalog, maybe Python or Java for their efficient data processing. These uh, small code bases uh, of microservices has also led to the faster development and deployment cycles. And in terms of resilience as well, uh, microservices help to contain failures. If one service encounters issues, it doesn't necessarily disrupt your entire application. And it also helps from the collaboration perspective as well among all the small teams that are working on the individual uh, microservices. Continuing on the same, your testing and maintenance has also become more manageable with uh, microservices due to the smaller code bases. And uh, this microservices pattern has also helped for the adoption of containers and Kubernetes and overall cloud native way of development. And uh, microservices, are kind of naturally fit for automated CI CD pipeline, which has resulted into the rapid and frequent uh, releases. I'm sure we know this famous line from Spider-Man movie where Uncle Ben conveys Peter that great powers, uh, with the great powers comes great responsibility. Similarly, in a microservice world with pun intended, I would say it comes with some greater security challenges as well. Why I will explain now. So what we have seen over the years is due to the microservice uh, architecture pattern, the attack surface has increased. Microservices often does expose multiple endpoints and API. So it increased the potential uh, attack surface. Attacker can target a specific service going back again to the same e-commerce application. If they know that payment service is the one which is processing all the payments, they can specifically target it. Service to service communication has also become a challenge uh, in microservice architecture. If we do not encrypt these service to service communication, uh, it can cause a damage to confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of the data that is been exchanged between the microservice. And uh, without encryption, network traffic between these microservices uh, normally happens in a plain text, and that makes it more susceptible for eavesdropping, attackers can gain access to the network and intercept and inspect the data that is being exchanged between the services. We normally call it as a passive attack. Uh, it can also lead to the man in the middle attack where an attacker intercept the communication between these microservices by either impersonating one or both the parties. Authentication and authorization as well across these uh, multiple microservices can become complex. Uh, we have seen already in past, I think, many banking scams uh, in regards to this. From data security perspective as well, we, uh, as part of cloud native development, we prefer our data being distributed across multiple microservices. Like take an example of your cloud storage service, uh, where your user files are stored across uh, microservices. So making sure that this uh, data at rest and in transit should be secured is quite highly important in today's world okay identity and access management as well like managing user identities and access controls across these uh, 
diverse set of microservices can become challenging and so it's a need of our to have a IAM solution, which is much uh, robust in a way. Code vulnerabilities as well. So smaller code base in microservices can sometimes lead to the overlooked uh, security vulnerabilities. Uh, we have seen a couple of time people pushing uh, sensitive data sometime as part of a hard coding and uh, runtime security as well. Like monitoring your microservices at runtime is also vital and due to the if the more number of microservices are there chances are that you may miss out on that part as well uh, to continue on the same uh, your api security as well so apis are the uh, most critical part of the microservices so properly ensuring sec and uh, securing those apis in like uh, input validation or uh, rate limiting these are the essential part to prevent uh, sql injection or abuse kind of attack now the more number of microservices are there it is important that you have a, a registry which contain list and information about all these microservices but at the same time if someone gets access to these uh, registry mechanism uh, then the attackers can redirect all the requests to some malicious services uh, so securing the service registry and discovery mechanism is also important from microservices security challenge perspective. Logging and monitoring as well, like centralized logging and monitoring did, are did important for detecting the suspicious activities. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you have these many 100 or 200 microservices. If you do not have a centralized logging uh, mechanism, it's become really hard to uh, gain the insights about how your microservices are behaving. Uh, container security as well, like if you are uh, using container-based microservices, then one need to ensure uh, there are properly configured and isolated uh, mechanisms to prevent container escapes or uh, privilege escalation attacks. And as now it is already happening, most of us are using the Kubernetes kind of orchestration platform. So maintaining a security of these kind of platform is also important as it hosts your entire application. API gateways as well, if I have to say, is I have seen it has been quite a uh, widely used option. So protecting incoming and outgoing traffic on these uh, services are also important. And we have also seen that many microservices rely on third party libraries and components. So securing them is also a big task. Okay. So uh, how does service mesh happen? I mean, well, the world was in a need of someone to come us, come ahead and help us with uh, some super mesh power to handle uh, securely and regulate this microservice world. So jokes aside, the emergence of service mesh can be traced back to the evolution of uh, application architecture. Like initially three tier web app DB kind of application practice was being practiced. However, as application grew in complexity, the challenges arose and companies found themselves writing custom libraries, client libraries, which uh, helps you with the request load balancing, circuit breaking, retries, and from the instrumentation perspective as well. So these libraries pose challenges when it comes to making some updates in them because it then require you to restart all your services as well. So to address this challenge, uh, proxies came into the scene. Proxies offered a solution that bypassed many of the limitation of the client libraries. And uh, unlike client libraries, Proxies can be upgraded without the need of recompilation and redeployment of your application. And this brought the flexibility and ease of maintenance for your microservices. And as then later cloud native practices gained prominence, officially a mesh of proxies emerged and it introduced the concept of deploying and managing proxies separately from your application lifecycle. So, uh, by creating a distributed mesh of these proxies, uh, one was able to standardize the runtime operation. And uh, it also provided a centralized API and then become a crucial component of microservices. And that's how 
Sarishmesh uh, has emerged over the years. Okay. So, uh, how does Sarishmesh help basically in security? And that too, especially in the world of Kubernetes. Well, uh, from authentication and authorization perspective, Sarishmesh enables strong authentication and authorization mechanism. For example, it allows only authorized services to access the sensitive uh, data from a sensitive microservices. Uh, the encryption MTLS feature basically of Sarishmesh helps you to protect your data in transit or at rest as well. So you can use any Sarushmesh tool of your choice like Linkerd or Istio. And this has helped to avoid eavesdropping or man in a middle attack basically. From a uh, traffic control and routing perspective, there are popular Sarushmesh mechanism which provides you a way to control the way traffic is flowing between the services and the way load balancing is happening. So their access control and circuit, circuit breaking abilities has also provided us a way to prevent security vulnerabilities getting in. Okay. And from observability and monitoring perspective as well. So Sarishmesh does emit metrics that can be captured and monitored by various monitoring tools like Prometheus and so on. So Sarishmesh platform is basically designed to provide the extensive observability and monitoring capabilities. So for example, service mesh like uh, is NY proxy in Istio or you can say Linkerd proxies. They generate a wide range of metrics that you can use. Uh, and based on those metrics, you can get the information about request rate, latencies, error rate, success rates, and all the other relevant data. And uh, solutions make sure that to provide this information either via HTTP endpoint or GRPC, uh, GRPC interface of a sidecast. And uh, you can set alert and visualization as well on them. And from distributed security policies perspective, it provides a centralized policy management and uh, enforcement tool across all your microservices. So it allows you to define security policies such as access control or authentication rule all in one place, uh, considered like a single plane of the glass. And it provides you a framework for real-time policy update and changes without a risk of misconfiguration and basically overall improving the security posture for your microservices uh, environment. From a service identity and authentication perspective, uh, with service mesh, you can implement uh, mechanisms like MTLS and JWT tokens that ensures that only authenticated service can communicate with each other. And uh, thus it strengthens the overall security of microservices by preventing unauthorized and uh, unrequired accesses. From runtime security perspective as well, it helps to detect the anomalies uh, by continuously observing the network traffic. And uh, from API security point of view as well, it can uh, help by doing the validation of inputs or incoming requests and uh, help us to detect attack like, as I mentioned, SQL injection. And from security upgrade and patching perspective as well, so with the sidecar proxies approach, one can independently upgrade their microservices. So even when you are upgrading proxies, uh, it will not recompile or redeploy your entire application itself. So that's how Service Mesh does help you from the security perspective. And I know we all do hate it, but uh, it's something that promotes fairness, safety, and ethical behavior in our life. Yes, I am talking about the term compliance. So let's see how Service Mesh helps with compliance uh, based on the different industries regulations. So uh, thanks to the enforcement of fine grained policies by Service Mesh, it helps you to the meet requirement uh, like those of GDPR to ensure data protection and privacy. The access control mechanisms provided by Service Mesh helps to comply the standards like HIPAA or PCI DSS. So Service Mesh makes sure that only authorized entities can interact with the sensitive data. 
Apart from that, it does provide you a centralized auditing and logging capabilities uh, to, to accurately gather report and brings the traceability. And uh, when it comes to data protection regulation like GDPR, HIPAA, the data encryption with MTLS feature that I mentioned prior is crucial as it maintains the confidentiality of data during the communication between different services. Okay. Uh, to continue on the same, uh, to comply with standard like ISO 27001, Service Mesh does offer governance and traceability features, uh, thus allowing organization to monitor and control all the service interaction. And uh, by identifying services and controlling traffic accordingly, it uh, helps to ensure that data flows align with the regulations like uh, GDPR's data residency restriction kind of. And uh, lastly, Service Mesh does support RBAC uh, that aids compliance with the uh, security standard like NIS SP 853 uh, by allowing organization to define and enforce the rollback access control policies. So, well, that's how the Service Mesh does help with the compliance angle as well. And uh, I mentioned prior that uh, the way Service Mesh uh, helps with the access control is by fine grained access policies. Uh, the service mesh platform like uh, Istio Linkerd does allow organization to define precise rules, uh, policies you can say, uh, using which you can control uh, and provide a secure access to only those who are needed for those services. The RBAC feature is also powerful, uh, for example, in Istio in particular. It enables you to define the roles and permission for services. Uh, it is kind of similar to the traditional access control mechanism, but tailored to the microservices. Uh, for example, for the payment service, uh, you can specifically define a particular role. And uh, the NY proxy kind of feature does help you for the dynamic authorization as well. As well. Uh, thus, it basically allows to make a decision at a real time based on various factors like uh, user identity, request context, or even the state of the system. Uh, apart from that, from identity and trust verification perspective as well, these are important factors. And that's where your MTLS kind of features does help you. Okay, so that's how ServiceMesh enhances the access control. And uh, how does service mesh helps basically from uh, observability and monitoring perspective is as I mentioned or uh, talked prior that it helps with the uh, imitation of the matrix uh, that you can collect from monitoring perspective and you can readily integrate it with any monitoring platform of your choice. Uh, platform like Istio and Linkerd are already offering a centralized logging aggregating of all the logs from microservices and uh, it helps uh, when it comes to the troubleshooting and maintaining compliance as it is a need of different audit requirement as well. Uh, and this uh, distributed application does require us to understand end-to-end -end flows like from the moment someone tries to access our application, how different, uh, how the client request is flowing from one service to other service. So service mesh out of the box does provide uh, capabilities to integrate with different uh, distributed tracing tools like uh, Jaeger or Zipkin. So that allows you to uh, see microservice, uh, how it is handling overall requests and it can help you to identify the bottlenecks as well. And uh, of course you can integrate these uh, monitoring platforms with the tools like Grafana and so on. And thus it can help you to the visualization part of uh, all your microservices current state as well. Okay. So uh, for example, this is very uh, small Grafana dashboard template uh, that can give you the insights about how service mesh capabilities uh, are able to fetch you the insights. Okay. Uh, so zero trust uh, security model is a kind of paradigm shift in network security that always emphasizes on never trust, always verify approach. With service mesh, all communication between the microservices is subject to strict verification and validation. 
and regardless of whether it occurs within the same cluster across the cluster or across the different cloud providers every interaction is getting evaluated against the defined policies and security rules and ensure that only authenticated and authorizes authorized services only can communicate with each other so uh, this approach significantly reduce the attack surface and uh, limit the lateral movement uh, within the microservice ecosystem and thus it does enhance security at the same time minimize the potential impact of the breach okay so i'm sure when we want to adopt some new tool we always uh, want to understand some of the best practices that can help us with uh, adopting that technology well so these are some of them that i have listed needless to say always do plan ahead uh, the deployment of service mesh take into the account uh, the size of your application and the complexity and the available resources secondly uh, evaluate different solutions there are multiple micro uh, service mesh available in the markets so first start understanding your specific use case and requirement and then uh, at the end of the day see every uh, service mesh platforms has their own uh, features at the same time trade offs so choose the one that aligns with your needs specifically third i would say is uh, always do start small like whenever i was working on our client's uh, requirement we always started with one uh, microservice try to move it into the service mesh try to gain that confidence and then move to move other services as well on our service mesh and uh, the capabilities like circuit breaking and retry policies of service mesh uh, do help you to handle the failures gracefully so do make sure to use them as it helps to prevent cascading failures and improve the service reliability okay and uh, needless to say always focus on observability and monitoring uh, always follow the shift left approach when it comes to security uh, the traffic management feature of service mesh is very powerful and uh, do make use of it uh, to do the traffic splitting as well as load balancing and uh, for the can read deployments as well as that can help you to do the zero downtime kind of deployments as well okay from namespace and resource isolation perspective as well uh, do configure uh, a specific compute for every namespace that your development teams are going to use uh yeah so this is crit crucial from the documentation and training perspective always make sure that your development as well as operational team are very familiar with handling service mesh then only uh, decide to move any microservice on the service mesh and uh, from disaster recovery and availability perspective as well always plan for uh, these kind of in a, uh, scenarios and do make sure to implement redundancy wherever necessary there are tools like uh, velero and all that can help you with those aspects from performance testing point of view as well uh, make sure you do the end to end performance testing for the microservices been moved on to the service mesh and try to ensure that there is no significant latency or bottleneck is been introduced in your microservice architecture uh, if you are using a commercial service mesh product uh, be aware of potential vendor lock in and consider open source alternative if uh, portability is your concern backup and restore strategy as well do make sure to have it in place already and those will save your time when it comes to the typical disaster scenarios and from uh, so service mesh policies as well uh, do make sure to enforce strict policies uh, when it comes to the traffic routing or security or access control so see uh, service mesh deployment can be complex uh, but by following the best practices certainly you will be able to successfully implement and manage service mesh for your microservice architecture and uh, helps to improve the reliability security and observability of your services okay uh, well now it's a demo time i will give you a small demo of service mesh capabilities around authentication and authorization 
using Istio as a service mesh here. Uh, see, these capabilities are available in all the service mesh tools, but in the end, I had to choose one. And so I decided maybe to use the Istio itself. So we will have one sample app and see how MTLS work uh, for internal secure communication among microservices, as well as how, how it helps uh, with JWT tokens to authenticate end users as well. Uh, so to save time, what I have done is I have recorded both the parts of it. We'll play them one by one and explain. But uh, prior to that, let's understand it with some visual diagrams. Uh, so our example uh, will have two namespaces called Fu and Bar with two microservices. One is HTTP bin and another is sleep. And both will run the NY proxy. Basically, they both are kind of onboarded on a service mesh. And we'll use another instance as well of HTTP bin and sleep uh, microservice, uh, which is running without sidecar. That means without service mesh in a namespace called as a legacy. So what we will do is we will try to send the traffic from each sleep and HTTP bin pod of each namespace to other uh, pods in the other namespace. So what we will ideally see is by default, Istio does track the server workload, which are migrated to Istio proxies. And it does configure the client proxies to send a mutual TLS traffic between those workloads. And for the non service mesh service, it use the plain text uh, traffic. So basically we will use MTLS for communication between uh, services from foo and bar namespace. But uh, when it comes to communicating with the services from the uh, legacy namespace, it will use the plain text format. Okay. So let me uh, play the video of it. So uh, as you could see here, we have uh, three namespaces, foo, bar, and legacy. Foo and bar are enabled with uh, Istio sidecar proxies, uh, whether as legacy is without any uh, sidecar proxies. That's the reason here, if you will see, they have only one uh, container, which is of those microservices, but uh, the containers uh, or pods from the bar and foo namespace are having two containers. Uh, which indicates that uh, the sidecar proxies has been enabled. We can verify the same by describing the pod from uh, either foo or bar namespace. And that's what we are going to do. We are going to describe now and see uh, in HTTP bin service from the bar namespace. So you can see here that uh, Istio sidecar proxy has been injected in that, which will make sure that uh, any communication that is happening with this uh, microservice will be via this uh, sidecar only, okay? And uh, now what we will do is basically from each microservice of each namespace here, using this simple curl request, we are trying to connect to other services. Right now, no Istio uh, policies has been enabled. That's the reason it will allow uh, si uh, so, uh, communication between the services uh, which have uh, sidecar enabled to the uh, services which even do not have uh, sidecar or service mesh been enabled. So basically, it will allow uh, communication in an MTLS way for those which are having sidecar, but at the same time for the one like legacy one, it will use the plain text communication. And how we can be very much sure of that is, if you will see now, whenever you uh, enable a sidecar uh, istio proxy what it does is that it add this x forwarded client cert header in the curl request uh, that originally comes from our microservices so here what we are doing is from uh, the pods from our foo namespace we are trying to send a curl request to the pod from the foo namespace and ideally, basically, these two uh, namespaces are now enabled with service mesh. That's the reason it should use the X forwarded client cert, which will uh, validate that the communication is happening in a MTLS by using the MTLS feature. 
uh, so to repeat again the x forwarded client cert header gets automatically added when service to service intercommunication is happening using the uh, mutual tls so this proves us that uh, it is using mtls for the secure communication and now let's try to uh, again uh, send a similar request but this time the curl request is to the microservice http bin from the legacy namespace and since now the request is going from uh, sidecar enabled uh, microservice to non service mesh or non sidecar enabled ideally this header will not be present that means the traffic flowing is happening in a plain text format which is a uh, risky in a way yeah so if you could see it was not able to gather anything and uh, now since we want to make sure that all our microservices are communicating with each other in a secure way alone we will enable a peer authentication policy of the istio so what this policy does help is for inter service communication uh, with mtls mode as a strict it makes sure that unless and until mtls is enabled for the microservices any traffic that is going to and fro from this uh, microservices with uh, service mesh will be rejected okay so now we have created this policy and now we will again try to run the same uh, curl request now what should happen this time is that any communication that is going to happen with legacy uh, uh, namespace based microservices should be rejected so our services with istio enabled will not be able to communicate with uh, legacy namespace based services because that communication was a plain text one which is risky as i can as i mentioned it can lead to use dropping or man in a middle attack okay so if you see here for communication from foo namespace to a uh, bar namespace it is generating 200 response but for sleep microservice from legacy namespace when it is trying to co connect uh, to our http bin service uh, from the foo namespace which has basically side uh, Istio uh, sidecar proxy enabled. Uh, it generated the exit code 56. That means it was not able to gather any data. So what happened here is the peer authentication policy observed that okay, someone uh, trying to send a plain text request to the ports or containers inside my particular namespace. Let me reject it and. That's how it uh, is giving the exit code 56. Okay. It will happen the same for uh, even if uh, your service tried to communicate with the other uh, microservice from the bar namespace as well. It will also get uh, exited with error code 56. So I hope uh, you are able to understand how service mesh does helps you uh, with this MTLS uh, feature to avoid any unsecured uh, connection to your microservices and thus it helps that all this intercommunication uh, inside the cluster is also secured in a way okay and now we will uh, move to the next demo which is about how an end user will be authenticated when he will try to connect uh, to your microservices which are covered by your uh, Istio service mesh. So for end user authentication purpose, if you could see here, uh, what we uh, will try to demo here is if someone want to connect to HTTP bin a microservice, uh, then that external end user request should connect it on port 80 and uh, it should get routed to HTTP bin uh, service via Istio gateway called uh, so here we are given name called as a http bin uh, gateway service okay and we have also configured the virtual service as well uh, so request will go from http uh, bin gateway to your uh, virtual service so if you describe the uh, gateway here a uh, gateway service here you will be able to see that it is trying to show that 
any request, uh, end user request that comes, uh, should come on port uh, 80. And uh, if it is coming uh, uh, with HTTP protocol, then route that request uh, to the Istio ingress gateway. That's what the purpose of this uh, uh, gateway uh, policy. Okay, uh, gateway resource, sorry. And uh, then we have also created this virtual service. What this virtual service basically is doing is that it is telling that when a request come in at the Istio gateway, that request should come to me on a virtual service. And then I will route that request on port 8000 to service HTTP bin. Uh, that's what uh, it is trying to denote here. Okay. And uh, we have also created a request authentication mechanism here. Uh, if you will do, yeah, as we, you can see here, the request authentication policy called the JWT example. So the way we had a peer authentication policy in Istio to uh, secure the service to service communication. If you want end user uh, traffic coming to your uh, service mesh based uh, microservice, then uh, you need to define a uh, resource called as a request authentication. Uh, this request authentication policy in uh, Istio service mesh helps uh, you to uh, validate that uh, the request that is coming is coming with a uh, JWT token, which is been issued by a particular uh, a predefined user. Here in this case, we are saying testing at the secure.io and it is also making sure that to check if uh, that request is uh, been validated with the public key, which is already, uh, which is something that Istio is already aware of. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, here could be the case that this request policy, authentication policy can detect uh, whether the request is uh, coming uh, with the right valid uh, JWT tokens or not, only if the some value uh, for token is assigned. But in case, let's say, no value or no token is passed, unfortunately, it does pass the uh, request inside. And so for the very same purpose, uh, we have created another authorization policy, as you could see here on screen. What this policy basically does is, it is telling Istio that if any end user request comes without any uh, JWT token, you basically need to deny that request. So we'll do a demo. We'll again try to send a curl request here. If you see, we are not passing any header, uh, any JWT valid token. So it will give you 403, uh, thanks to that authorization policy that we defined. And uh, now, thanks to the request authentication policy that we have defined, Let's say uh, I'm randomly passing some uh, JWT tokens like dead beef or something. So what it ha should happen is it should uh, reject that request. And that's the reason you are able to see it has given 401 error. Uh, what for this demo purpose I have done is I have uh, stored or picked up the token, which is available here uh, on a Istio uh, sample uh, examples. So I have stored that uh, inside a token variable. And now that token is uh, basically this one, which is a valid token. So any end user request that is coming with this token should be will uh, should be allowed by our Istio. And that's what you will see now. So here I will again run the same curl request. Now here this time, if you see, I am passing it the JWT token, uh, which has been rightly issued. And now, as you could see, it is giving 200 uh, response. So that's how uh, Istio service mesh basically helps you with the end user authentication and authorization. Uh, again, to repeat, Istio was just one example. These features are pretty common in any service mesh that you use. And uh, that does help uh, you with the security and compliance perspective as well. So uh, that's uh, very much from this uh, webinar. 
and i hope you find it insightful and took away something new from this uh, webinar and uh, you can reach out to me at any time on linkedin or twitter for any query around service mesh and thank you so much again for watching this uh, thanks